This week on The Aviators, we're back for another season, and to kick it off, we're heading back to the basics with Aviation 101. We're getting to know our Aviators hosts a little bit better. Most people think of Cessna as they think high wing tricycle gear. And we're going to meet the newest member of the Aviators team, country music star George Canyon, and learn how he overcame diabetes to become a pilot. is made possible by Zeon PCAS XRX, the first ever portable collision avoidance system with direction. The XRX shows traffic information on its screen or on a wide variety of compatible GPS displays. For more information, contact Zeon Flight Systems. One of the many problems that confounded man's first attempts at controlled flight was where to find an engine that was light enough to take flying and how to convert that horsepower into thrust. Since the Wright brothers first unlocked the secret in 1903, engines from all sorts of sources, including motorcycles and automobiles, and in all different configurations, including inline and horizontally opposed, have been flying on the front of aircraft. When engineers were first challenged to develop an engine that produced the maximum amount of horsepower with a minimum amount of weight, they thought about orienting the cylinders radially around the crankshaft. These engines are pretty efficient. This nine-cylinder radial engine is only about this thick and produces 600 horsepower to take this aircraft flying. The Jet Age was born in the 1950s around a completely new concept in aircraft engine design. This engine doesn't work anything like the piston engine in your automobile. With this type of engine, the engineers were able to design new aircraft that operated at higher speeds and higher altitudes than man had ever experienced. To accomplish this, two forms of turbine-powered aircraft engines were born. Turbojets, most often used in military fighter aircraft, and turbofans, which are used on everything from commercial airliners to private jets. Both operate on the same basic principle. On a turbojet, air flows into the engine via an air intake and then directly into a series of fan blades called a compressor. Once the air is highly compressed, it then flows into a combustion chamber where fuel is added and then ignited. The combustion forces the air into a turbine, causing it to spin. As the turbine spins, a gear shaft also causes the compressor in front of the engine to turn. This is why turbines are so efficient. They provide a portion of their own power. Once leaving the turbine, the gases are then allowed to rapidly expand through a nozzle to regular pressure. This rapid expansion results in a jet plume propelling the aircraft forward. In a turbofan model, a fan sits in front of the compressor drawing air in. Some of the incoming flow is diverted past the combustion chamber and directly into the exhaust nozzle. While this method does not produce the same raw propulsion, it is much quieter. That's why most commercial and private jets use turbofan designs. Jet aircraft are well suited to long trips at high altitudes, but sometimes for shorter flights, propellers are still more efficient. The turboprop classification of aircraft uses the same hot section as a jet engine does. The air is drawn in from the front, it's rooted all the way back here to the back where it's turned 180 degrees and makes its way through the hot section. Except this time, instead of the exhaust propelling the aircraft forward, the exhaust actually runs a gearbox that makes the propeller spin. Regardless of the engine or the type of aircraft, all fixed wing aircraft work on the same basic theory. The wing is a truly magical invention that literally picks the airplane up into the air. When you look at various wing designs from overhead, you can see straight like this, delta wing, swept wing, trapezoidal, elliptical, all sorts of different wing designs. But if you look at a cross section of the wing, they're going to look very similar every time. First thing to understand is that air particles are fluid, much like water. While they may not have the same density or cohesion as water particles, they both observe the same physics and interact with objects in a similar way. Picture, if you will, individual streams of air flowing in a horizontal fashion. Without anything interrupting or changing their flow, they move smoothly and are evenly distributed. 
When a wing is added to the equation, it disrupts the regular flow of air. This in turn causes different pressures on the wing and on the air particles themselves. Air moving along the top is initially compressed and pushed upwards. As it curves along the top of the wing and downstream, it is decompressed towards an area of low pressure. The air moving along the bottom of the wing, while initially compressed downwards, smooths out and maintains relatively uniform pressure throughout. The difference in pressure between the top and bottom of the wing, combined with the forward thrust of the engine, caused the aircraft to lift off the ground. As Jeff mentioned earlier, the elevator of an aircraft has an effect on the pitch of the aircraft up or down. When you pull back on the yoke, the elevator tilts in such a way as to force the tail of the aircraft down as the rest of the aircraft pitches upward. And it's the same with the ailerons. When one aileron is up, the air pressure forces that wing down and the other aileron would be down, forcing that wing up. Aviator's host Raylene Ranger is a pilot who not only has her ATPL, but in the process has racked up several ratings. As a 737 pilot, it goes without saying that she's familiar with multi-engine aircraft, but Raylene has her fair share of hours on floats as well. But this year she's getting her fill of new experiences, like formation flying with the Aeroshell T6 Texans. But regardless of whether you're an airline transport pilot like Raylene, a commercial pilot, a private pilot, or a student, you have to be able to pass a medical examination. And although it may be out of your control, certain conditions can bar you from being a pilot altogether. According to the FAA, a number of conditions can disqualify an individual from obtaining a medical certificate, including angina, bipolar disease, coronary heart disease, epilepsy, diabetes, substance abuse, and psychosis. However, they will allow exceptions if the pilot can show that their condition can be controlled via medications or other regular procedures. For George, controlling his diabetes became a goal, and ultimately a way for him to eventually fulfill a lifelong dream. Well, the most important thing in not giving up was I, I didn't give up on the dream of being a pilot and, uh, and being in the Air Force, I gotta be honest, I, I, I was stubborn. I, control my diabetes, live my dreams. I kept going through my head. I had that stuck in my head since I was a kid. And I said, I'm not gonna quit, and I'm never gonna quit, and I'm never gonna let it go. And, uh, and I did, and thanks to my wife, who's kind of elemental behind everything that I do right, she, she stood behind me, and I remember talking to her about it, and she said, you should give it a shot, and I did. And uh, I did jump through some, some hoops, but you know what? Uh, God bless the Transport Canada, because I mean, they are allowing type one diabetics to fly. For George, diabetes has meant a couple of extra steps in his pre-flight and in-flight checks that most pilots don't have to worry about. Well, when I fly, uh, especially, um, I test my sugar immediately, and um, then if it's in the right place, Get, you know, do my walk around, do everything, uh, everything that needs to be done. Get in the airplane, taxi, do my run up, taxi out, test again just before I take off, just to make sure. Get up there and I test every 30 minutes. And uh, my airplane has an autopilot on it. I never use my autopilot, ever, but you know, just for show. Uh, but it, it actually, in all honesty, has come in extremely handy, um, especially in last year when this event we did with uh, type 1 diabetic kids and, and my airplane. My autopilot came in really handy because I was able to test and do what I needed to do and I had my insulin pump working and it was awesome. Type 1 diabetes affects the body's ability to produce insulin, an important hormone in breaking down sugar in the blood. Usually type 1 diabetics have to manually regulate the insulin level in their body with injections. Thanks to a special insulin pump, George doesn't have to manually regulate his insulin levels as closely. I'm taking control of my diabetes, and every diabetic, no matter how young they are, can do this. Just take control of the proper level. And my, uh, my Animus insulin pump, which just happens to be clipped to my side right now, this thing really gave me back my life. Um, I remember what it was like when I was 13 years old and, and a type one uh, coming into 14. And when I was 13, I, I lived a normal life. I didn't think anything about, I ate what I wanted, I did what I want. Becoming a diabetic, that changed everything. And, this pump has given me that freedom back. I've gone and, and been able to be in the music business successfully and not have to worry like I used to in the past. Or, oh, I gotta make sure I eat. I gotta, oh, what time is it? I gotta. I don't do that anymore. Now with this pump, 
I still exercise regularly, as everyone should, not just type 1 diabetics. I eat appropriately, like everyone should, not just type 1 diabetics. But this thing lets me, certain days in my life, forget I'm even diabetic. It's unbelievable. If you're looking for more information about any of the Aviation 101 topics we've covered this episode, or if we've gone through any of these topics just a little too quickly for you, you can find that information on our website at www.theaviators.tv. There you'll also find profiles of all of us. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week on The Aviators. Season 1 and Season 2 of The Aviators are now available on DVD. For more information on today's segments, visit www.theaviators.tv. From our official home at the Whitman Regional Airport in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, we'll see you next time on The Aviators. The Aviators is made possible by... Zeon's PCAS XRX, the first ever portable collision avoidance system with direction. The XRX shows traffic information on its screen or on a wide variety of compatible GPS displays. For more information, contact Zeon Flight Systems.